It is 5.30 and we are ready to start. Finally, can relax and chat. <laughs> oh, I know. Sorry, no. Stay on. It is 5:30. We one. 5:31. We are at the Legacy Campus in the boardroom. It is the third of June, 2021. We are here for a Cache County School District board meeting, and. We welcome everyone who's here for We will start with roll call. Larry Jepson, board member. Randall Bagley, board member. Roger Pulsifer, board member. Terry Rhodes, board member. Kathy Christiansen, board member. Jeff Nielsen, board member. And Dale Hansen, business administrator. And Superintendent Steve Norton and Chris Corcoran, board member, are excused. We will now have the pledge and mission statement by Roger Pulsifer. Our, mi oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Terry. our mission is to educate students for success in a changing world. Thanks, Roger. I was going to thank you before you said that. <laughs> and there is no public input, so we will move to our action agenda, which is uh, has one item on it of hiring the new business administrator for the school district, uh, Jared Black, and I will take a motion on that. I move that we hire Jared Black as uh, our new business administrator. I second it. Okay, all in favor, we'll vote. All the votes are in and unanimously in favor of the motion. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to our reports agenda. Uh, the learner validated attendance policy will be presented by Kurt Jenkins. Speaking on this or just leaving it as it is? All right, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank the board for the cookies they dropped off. And I hope that we weren't supposed to share those with anybody. I can't remember what the policy was on that one. Um, and thanks. Um, thank you for putting me first tonight. It's, it's very nice. Thank you. So I was tasked with coming up with a uh, learner validated attendance policy that we could put into place, uh, particularly after a year where most things were had some online pieces to it. So um, you've probably had a chance to look through that. I know Kathy has already. So if you have any questions, I might be able to answer for you. So um, by state law, we have to have this policy in place. So if we want to have any adjustments to the 180 days, 900, 990 hours rule, right? Yes, that's part of that ruling. That's exactly right, yeah. And with the increase in online and more clarification about what that is from. So, so how does this allow us flexibility with that, uh, with the days and hours rule? Because, well, this is, that would be more attendance validated program and this would be more learner validated program. So it'd be based on the efforts. You could see that in part B in the continuing enrollment measures for online. Um, so based on, um, I guess a good explanation for that is um, 
you know, some people might attend a class either trimester or quarterly or semester, a math class, but that would be different based on whatever district that you might be in. Uh, online could be the same thing. Maybe a class is based on 70 minutes for one district or one school, 45 minutes for another, but the time that they put into the work for, uh, for that class online may be even more than that. So that's kind of how that. Okay. I just, when I read the, when I read the, the bill and the code that was uh, approved and the state board rule, it just said that we had to have a learner validated program policy in place to have any, um, it, to expect any adjustments to the hours and days or so. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks for making that possible for us. No, you're welcome. That's it, Jeff, you look like you have a question for me. No question, thanks. Huh? Awesome. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you. Next, we will have a presentation by our wonderful school counselors, those who are here, on the Secondary Comprehensive Guidance Program Application. I'm gonna step back here by the computer, have a little bit of PowerPoint to go through, and the reason why the meeting was so noisy when we started is because the counselors are here. <laughs> so I appreciate them being here and supporting their schools and the program because they play a, they are a huge part of what happens in our schools every day. And what, we, what we're doing here tonight is each year, the school board has to be updated, is required to be updated on what we are doing in comprehensive guidance and that the board approves of what we're doing and as well, you're aware of the budgets and how the money is being handled and so I'm gonna start going through this and then there'll be a point in this presentation where I'll have two of the schools present their data projects. Each school every year is required to submit a data project, uh, something that they choose at their school they're gonna focus on to improve. And all of our schools have submitted those, but I just picked two tonight that you'll be able to um, see what their goals were and I hope you ask them all kinds of questions about it. Okay, that'd help them. but. So we'll, the, there's our purpose why we're here, for the board to take an action. There's a competency that our guidance counselors have to work under. There's four major uh, competencies. To qualify to receive the comprehensive guidance funds every year, a school must do these follow, following areas. They have to implement the PCCR plant policy that we have in the district. They have to complete their yearly data project they have to complete an annual self-evaluation and then uh, complete a performance review conducted. And that, that happens different ways. Every six years, they'll have a formal one from the state. Every three years, there'll be an internal one uh, within the district by a, by a team that will review them. Or they'll complete a self-evaluation if they're in between those years. So, but irregardless, every year they're evaluating themselves based on the standards for the state. Then they net, um, must meet the assurances and the seven qualifying standards for the program, and I'll show those to you. So there are the seven standards that the counselors focus on in their schools all year long. And then below those seven standards are the assurances. A couple I'll just point out is the board adoption, and that's what we're doing tonight. So when they actually have a review by the state, they can document that they, they had their program brought to the school board, presented, and the board approved it. That's what we're doing right now is meeting that assurance, that part of a, a, an evaluation of the program. This is what the money looks like for comprehensive guidance. The state um, total has 11.5 million available and and, and we're talking only secondary uh, comprehensive guidance counseling, okay? That's all that we're funded is secondary counselors. Anything we're doing with elementary is coming totally out of the district's general funds or it's coming through grants in some way. But there is no state funding for counselors K through six at this point. 
but we've had it for quite a few years with secondary. So Cash Districts receives just about $364,000. Last year it was about three hundred twenty-two. so you can see the increase that we uh, picked up this year. And so funding for qualifying schools, it's based on student enrollment, are the counselors endorsed, and are, are we meeting the one to 350 ratio? And I'll talk about that ratio here in just a minute. If you look there in the middle where it says cash district, this is how we are distributing the funds. So right now, personnel, we, we allocate $210,000 for the paraprofessionals. Every one of our schools receive one eight hour a day, no, six hour, seven hour a day? What is it? Six hour, 180 days paraprofessional that works directly with the counselors. So every secondary school has that. By the time you do the benefits and pay the salary, that's the 210,000. The remaining, then the 101,000 is allocated out directly to schools based on their enrollment. We do have indirect costs associated with these funds, 41,000. And then I've always kept a reserve of 10,000 in case I need to dip into something to keep the program in balance as we go through the year. It shows you there below what the funds can be used for. And uh, when we allocate those funds to the schools, it's their decision what they're doing with those funds. Um, and they'll do all of those four things. But it's, up, it's their decision how they do it, what they do with the money. This is what we look like um, as far as our ratio goes. With our eight schools, we have a number of counselor FTEs of 27.5. FTEs, and it's uh, showing you up there that the general budget pays for 26.167 counselors, CTE pays for one and a third counselors. Now you go by each school, North Cache has three counselors, South Cache three, Spring Creek two, Green Canyon has four, Mountain Crest four, Ridgeline five, Skyview four, and Cache High one. And this next year, we're going to have interns at, each, at certain schools. North Cache, Skyview, and Green Canyon will have uh, full-time interns. Because of their numbers, uh, then we were able to get a full-time intern, and we, have, we pay them half salary. But most of them have to have that kind of an internship as they're going through the guidance program. So we're really helping them get through the guidance program at the university. So if you go down through their... All of our counselors have a 198 day contract and there's their FTE for that. So the state ratio requirement is 350 to one. If we take our, what we've allocated in counselors, our district right now is 340 to one. And that includes the interns that we have allocated there. So we're just barely making the, the ratio for the state, which is that's usually where we hover is right around there, that number. The, um, we have made some significant improvements in comprehensive guidance, and I won't read those for you specifically. You can see um, what we're doing, and you're gonna hear some of the data projects tonight. There has been times when our student ratio has been over 350 to one, and at that time, we have to write a report to the state and say what we're going to do to correct that. I put in there elementary emerging support. I should have changed that. It's no longer emerging support, it's full support. Don't we have a counselor in every elementary now? So it's really full support at the elementary level. But here again, that has really has nothing to do with these funds that I'm talking to you about here tonight. Now the data projects, uh, we rotate this every year. Uh, South Cash will present their data project and then Green Canyon will present theirs. And you can see what they focused on for the year. But like I said, every school is required to do a data project, but you'll just see two of them tonight. There you go. Tell them who you are. Okay. My name is Melanie Francis, and I'm one of the counselors at South Cash Middle School. We have two other counselors there, but one is on his way to New York and the other is at a high school graduation. So we'll have to excuse them tonight. Um, this year, under the circumstances, 
of the closing of last year when we were looking at what we wanted to focus on, we knew there were gonna be a lot of challenges, academic, attendance, mental health, all of those different things. So we were looking through some of our data and our last state needs assessment um, in 2018-19, we came across some data um, that showed that 84% of our seventh grade students felt comfortable coming to the counseling office um, and meeting individually with their counselor. 87% felt comfortable coming into the center. And as we looked at that under the circumstances, we didn't feel like that was high enough going in to the following year because we were very worried, especially about those seventh graders coming from elementary school and that big transition for them. There are so many stressors when they come and then to have such a different school year and not have really been able to close out elementary like they wanted to. So we um, made a presentation that we went in and did to all of the classrooms right at the beginning of the school year that we just really introduced ourselves more as people. Um, so we had pictures of what we looked like without our masks, pictures of our families, talked about what we like to do, what our hobbies are, and then really just explained the different resources of the counseling department, how they can access help, how they can come down, um, just to try to make, make them feel more comfortable with it. And then a few weeks later, we went back in, um, talked about more resources like the Safe UT app and how to get help anonymously if they still didn't feel comfortable coming down and talked about you know our hope squads and suicide prevention and things like that. And then throughout the year, we just made a really um, valiant effort to be more visible to the kids. So we made sure we were volunteering in the lunchroom to take cards. We were running enrichment activities during hero hour and just trying to help the kids see us out around them more. And so we did some um, polling, some surveying of the kids through the year and that 84% that felt comfortable seeing their counselor um, got up to 96% by the end of the year and coming into the counseling center went from 87% to 94. And so we felt really good about that. We were shooting with 90% and we're kind of worried maybe that was too high. And we realized that not all kids feel comfortable coming in for everything, but we hope if we can even get them comfortable coming down for academic concerns or peer concerns or things like that, that hopefully we can help them with all their different things that they might be struggling with through those years. So any questions? Do you feel like this will help um, um, younger siblings of those seventh grade students by helping them to, uh, 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 those seventh grade students are gonna go home and talk about interactions with people at school, right? Yeah, I think it will definitely help younger siblings as well as these students as they mature and get older and get into the high schools and things like that. Um, and younger siblings, when they hear, oh, well, if you're struggling with this, go talk to your counselor. If you're struggling with this, go talk to your counselor. Um, so that we can just have that, I don't know, that open door policy and kids feel like they can come in regardless of what the issue is, is our goal, so. Any other questions? questions? <laughs> when you talk to the students about being comfortable, were they given a, a test or a, how was that? It, a it was a survey, survey that they were given. So we go in and teach lessons in different classes through the year. So at the end of one of those lessons, two different times through the year, we just added those two questions at the end of the surveys that we normally just to see what they learned in the lesson, just through those on the end about how they were feeling comfortable with us or with the counseling center in general. With uh, this increase, did you see an increase in students who were experiencing serious challenges and problems coming for help? We definitely feel like we saw an increase in mental health concerns this year. Um, the academic and things, we still felt like we're kind of pulling the kids down for those. They don't come down on their own as much for those, but for mental health concerns, I would definitely say we saw an increase of that this year. Thank you. Right. Okay, Do I need to hold this up by me? <clears throat> Thanks for letting us come tonight. Um, my name is Clint Fulmer. I'm one of the counselors at Green Canyon. Max Jones is another one. 
Jennifer Hartman is another one, and Grant Calverly was uh, running some family errands tonight, so he couldn't make it, so please excuse him. <clears throat> um, I want to thank the other counselors for being here tonight and supporting. It's always a party when this group shows up, and it's, it's fun to have them here tonight, too, a little bit. Um, just a little bit, we chose, um, our, we've been doing our career fair as our data project the last couple of years, but I want to give you just a little bit of background, and then we'll talk about the career fair and some numbers here in just a minute. When we split off from Skyview, uh, Jennifer and I and Max, when there was just the three of us, we got together and we started talking about, through our experience, career um, literacy and where we wanted it to go. So our data project kind of fits underneath one of the standards that Mike talked about under career literacy, standard number four. And uh, it's not a novel idea, but we really wanted to start speaking the language and creating a culture of the school that we talk about careers first, and then if it requires college, we talk about college at that point. Colleges have had the lion's share of our kids' attention for a long time, and we, and we really notice, and I think these guys would probably agree, that so many students, when the colleges descend upon us, there's a good chunk of students that goes, well, that's not for me, I guess I'll go over to this side of the school and hang out. And the, the point of school really is to get us educated to go on and do a career and a vocational and something that you enjoy doing. And so we've started preaching in the classrooms and it goes through our PCCR meetings, our individual meetings, all the way through what we're starting to spend some of our tools for, tools for schools grants, excuse me, on things in the hallway talking about careers. Um, and of course, college is always there. We don't really need to sell college to tell people how important it is. It's, but we felt like we needed to go through the careers a little bit more and say, Let's reverse engineer this just a little bit and talk about what you're motivated and what you're excited about. What gets you, what are you passionate about? Okay, well that requires a two year vocational degree. That one does require graduate school. And then go from there, because once you start with the passion, you're not quite as worried about all the training as long as you get to what you want to go to. So that was, the, that was the idea behind it. And we also developed a career assistance team at Green Canyon High School. We try to keep several teachers on it. We keep community members on it. So we're always trying to think of new ways to talk about careers to the students. And we meet, we meet once each trimester. We call that our career assistance team. And this career fair kind of was born out of that and, and it changes each year. And each, each, each meeting we try to come up with new ideas on that just a little bit. So that's a little bit of background to how we got to this point and why we're doing this still as our data project. We've been pushing careers for a while and we still have a ways to go but we feel that it's a worth, worthwhile endeavor to keep finding new ways to expose students to the many different things that are out there. Now more than ever, it seems like there's more jobs than people at this point, at least we're feeling that right now. Troy Lamb stopped, from, stopped by from Career Workforce Services and letting us know that there's four jobs for every one person in Cache Valley right now. And so we have ways to go and we need to make sure we're exposing our students and, and, and all that are coming in contact with our community and make sure we're working together. I'll turn the time over to Jennifer just a little bit to mention a couple things here. Thanks. So maybe a career fair seems pretty standard, you know, for a high school, but honestly on the north end for high schools, we hadn't seen it for what, about 20 years. And so it was kind of fun when we introduced this three years ago. So our first one, um, you know, we were just kind of testing the waters and we're really pleased by the number of businesses that were excited enough to come. Um, we spent a little bit of time with teachers and trying to encourage them to get their students excited because we um, staggered the times when they could walk through the gym and, and see all of the um, booths. And yet we realized afterwards that we probably didn't hit that hard enough. So the following year, which was last year during COVID, we were two weeks shy of having our career fair when we shut everything down. <laughs> so, um, but we, we had an, um, an amazing number of businesses that were ready to come and we felt like we were prepared. So we used that working document to put together this year's and then added to that even. So we're really, really pleased. Um, we especially like our graph. Um, if you'll notice, we, we did increase the number of students that attended, um, the number of businesses that attended, the classrooms that came as a whole. And a couple things that we um, noticed is, as um, Clint alluded to earlier, a lot of our businesses came with the idea of hiring students, and we weren't prepared for that. We were just thinking that they were gonna get to explore all the different types of careers. And so we heard back, one of the top feedback um, points that they made is send the kids with resumes next year and let them know that we will be doing hiring. So we're gonna incorporate, it'll be a, um, a career job fair next year. And so, you know, we'll continue to add to it. But I think we've probably finished up our data project doing a career fair and we'll, we'll pick something else up. Um, so if you're interested, come to our career fair next year. Yeah, yeah. but now, so I'm going to have um, 
I'm gonna have Max answer all your questions, so shoot away. <laughs> Oh, there's no questions, thanks, appreciate it. Are there any questions? The, so Clint said that um, it has gone well, but you have a long way to go, what does that mean? Well, we, I mean, we're, we're always exploring new ideas. And so, you know, like, like he said, we've talked to people from, from our community, as well as some of our teachers to even add different ideas to our career assistance team. So um, one of the things that we, we started in our school is, um, we put career trees and so like right now we've got one in our science hall and so all the different careers that have science is their you know, main area of focus so like a lot of your medical you know your, your veterinary sciences and just different things like that so we're putting more information out there about careers and how kids can access those careers um, the other thing we're looking at to at quite a bit is They've got a new program called Youth Science. Uh, yeah, Youth Science. It's actually through precision exams, and it, it's got a lot of information out there about how kids can access different careers based on their um, their skill sets more so than their just their interests. And so there's things like that that we're trying to tap into a little bit more to help our kids understand what careers are out there and how they can access those careers. And it's not always, gosh, you have to go to Utah State University. I mean, that's not a bad thing, but there's a lot of great jobs out there that you can go down to Bridgerland and get a, you know, a certification in something and get into a great career rather quickly if that's what you wanna do. So helping those kids tap into those, that's kind of where our goals are. What, what kind of feedback are you getting from employers that, what is it that, that's missing or that we could, you know, what, what skills are there that really seem to be in demand that uh, maybe we're not providing uh, opportunity for? Well, I don't know if it's not so much we're not providing. I think it's more that we're not helping our kids get exposed to those. Okay. Um, there's a lot of great things out there, like, again, go down, going down to Bridgerland, for example. And, and our kids, you know, no fault of theirs. I mean, we've been preaching it for the last 40 years or, or longer. Gosh, you got to go to college. You got to go to the university. You got to get a bachelor's degree. You got to do all this stuff. And in reality, there's a lot of great jobs out there that you don't need that. Now, granted, a lot do. But I mean, one of the things that I always talk to to him about is, you know, I've got a brother-in-law that's a, you know, a contractor, and he went to college for a year and said, Gosh, this is not for me. And you know, he, he started doing his his you know carpet laying and. Now he's making a whole heck of a lot more than me, and I've got, you know, eight years of school or more, you know? Right. So, you know, just those things, tapping, getting those kids exposed to some of those things is what's important, I think. Okay. Do you have a certain amount of your time that you have to focus in on this particular project in your schools, or do you just do whatever you can? Well, the majority of our time has to be with students. And so anytime we're helping students, whether it be going to college or careers, we can, we can count all that. So yeah, this is all time that we count towards, you know, helping kids planning their, for their college and careers. So that's a big chunk of our time. I know you wear a lot of hats yeah. in this job. <laughs> and for me, the most important thing is that the kids who need help get counseling help whenever. So that's where my question is coming yeah. from. Does it work so that that happens with this program? Oh yeah. Because we're, I mean, even even when we're in our in our meetings, you know, if we have our um, career assistance team meeting, we're still at, available to out to the students no matter what. I mean, they'll come in and grab us and say, "Hey, you, come and do this," no matter what meeting we're in. So, as long as we're in the school, we're at we're available to the students. Okay. So that's a good thing. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for letting us much. present. Thanks to all our counselors. Good job. I put a list up there of the counselors at each school so you can see. I did not put the um, mentors up there, but before the counselors leave, I'm gonna have them stand up and just say what school they're at. So you're aware of that, their name and where they're at. I'm, I'm Jennifer Losher at Ridgeline High School. I'm Annette Hepworth at North Cash Middle School. Melanie Francis at South Cash. 
Tara Johnson Ridgeline. I'm Janine Justice, I'm at Skyview. Jennifer Hartman, Green Canyon. Clint Fulmer, Green Canyon. I'm Max at Green Canyon. I'm Alex Hansen at Ridgeline High School. I'm Lonnie Evans at Cash High School. I'm Chris Hart at Mountain Crest High School. I'm Angela Wood at Mountain Crest High School. Craig Bracken and I'm at Ridgeline. I'm just glad they're here and I'm glad we have them in our district. They're great counselors. So that's all we have, board members. Mike, could you um, attach your uh, PowerPoint to something in board, uh, this agenda in board docs or the minutes so that you can have a copy of it? Yeah, I'll, for some reason I thought I'd put it in board docs, but if not, I'll put it in board docs tomorrow. All right, that'll be yeah, great. Yeah, I can you. put that there. All right. Thank, Thank you, you all for Thanks coming. Everybody. You don't have to stay for the rest of the, we'd love it if you did, but you don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> Are you doing next? We appreciate everything you do at our schools. And now, next on our agenda, we'll have the tentative negotiation agreements uh, presented by Kirk McCray. Is this the mic? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, um, I'm a little uh, hurt that they didn't want to stick around and listen to me, um, but I don't blame them at all. Um, Tonight, uh, I'm bringing to you um, tentative agreements from all three of our employee groups, um, our teachers, our educational support or classified employees, and our administrators. And um, I'm happy to report that um, our working relationship with each one of those groups is very strong, very collaborative, um, and they recognize that um, as we put the budget together, which I, I notice is later in your agenda, that um, we really do try to prioritize um, the great employees that we have. Uh, we know that that's the best investment we make. And so as we get new money coming into the district, um, we try to find ways to, to um, funnel that to those employees, uh, recognizing um, the, the great work that they do for our students. Um, so, uh, I think you uh, received copies of these tentative agreements. Do you have those? Okay. I, I'll, I'll just go through each one of these uh, kind of quickly. There's a lot of similarities, as you'll see, uh, in, in all of them, but in each one of them, there's a, a, a minor difference here or there. Um, the cost of living increase for our teachers was five and a quarter percent. Um, and as far as we can tell, um, that's the largest increase that we've had for over 20 years. And um, our teachers were very appreciative of that. And um, in addition to that, um, we did um, agree to fund our health insurance plan by an additional 12% next year. Um, that one, uh, for me in particular, is hard to swallow. Um, we have a new health insurance plan that's in place this year. It's called BIND. Um, we expect that those rates will stabilize as we go forward. Um, we're only, we only have data from the first two quarters um, as we make this decision. And we're being um, somewhat cautious in making sure that that's adequately funded. But that is in addition to um, the cost of living increase. And so that's part of their compensation package. And if they uh, felt like that was not a wise use of those resources, we could have easily said, well, let's put that on salary and um, have employees pay that 12% um, of the premium. But that's not the decision that they made. And I, I think it was a good decision. 
Um, but I'm hoping that next year when we have this discussion that we are not looking at that kind of an increase for insurance. Um, so we'll wait and see how this year finishes out. Um, but you'll see that that 12% funding increase was uh, common for, for all of our employee groups. Um, steps and lanes, uh, especially for our teachers, is a, is a real cost. As, as our teachers advance in their years uh, with steps and as they qualify for lane changes with additional professional development and degrees, um, there is a cost there and we have always had a high priority to maintain that salary schedule and that's uh, something that we also agreed to with our teachers. Um, these next two items with our teachers are unique to them. The first one is changing their base contract from 183 days to 186. Um, that's not really a, a true net gain for them, uh, but it does allow us to reflect those three days on the salary schedule. Those three days that we've added are professional development days that we've um, paid our teachers for, but they were optional days. Um, and for two reasons. Number one, we, we didn't want them to be optional. We think that it's really important that they come and, and participate in those days. Um, and number two, we want our salary schedule to really reflect the true um, salary that our teachers are getting, and, and they do too. So this, this was a mutually agreeable um, uh, change. Um, the school calendar doesn't change uh, because those days were already built into the calendar for next year, uh, but we, we can show that on the uh, teacher salary schedule. Um, and I will say that at 183 days, we were on the lower end uh, of base contracts uh, compared to other districts in Utah. So bringing that up to 186 is definitely uh, closer to what most other districts are at. Um, can I ask a question? Sure. How, how do you feel would be a good way to help teachers understand that that is the base, the base number of days and hours? Um, I, know, I know teachers work really hard, but so do every other professional. And sometimes it seems that teachers feel uh, or act like, I've put in my time, I'm done. Um, good, good question, and, and there's really two parts to that because uh, one part is the amount of days that they spend and the other um, part of the question is the amount of hours that they spend. And the vast majority of our educators, um, they go well beyond both the days and the hours that, that we require at a minimum. Um, and so um, this, uh, changing the, the base contract, um, again, 95, 98% of our um, teachers participated in that professional development and they were paid for that. Um, so I, 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 I think that if there is any sediment out there along those lines, it's, it's, it's small and, and we do work with them. We do have another policy in place that is the minimum contract day and that is um, a half hour before the bell rings and a half hour after. Um, it's, it's rare that we have a discussion with an educator that's not meeting that because they spend so much more time there. Um, but occasionally, uh, we do have to remind them of this is the minimum requirement. And that minimum daily requirement also includes assignments made by their principal or supervisor um, for professional development, um, extracurricular activities, things like that. And generally speaking, um, our staffs are very supportive of that. Um, so I don't think that that's uh, widespread. Uh, we, we don't see that, but occasionally we do have to um, remind them. All right, thank so, you. So, yeah. Um, and then the last thing with our teachers, um, we did uh, agree to, we, we've got a parental leave uh, provision uh, for teachers who are uh, either involved in the birth or adoption of a child. 
And if they have saved their sick leave, um, the parental leave allows them to use that accumulated sick leave for that purpose. Um, 30 days, uh, we, we've had some uh, pushback recently that that's not enough. And to, to reframe this, they, they do get 12 weeks under FMLA, but that's not paid. And the reason parental leave is important is because sick leave generally doesn't cover the regular birth or adoption of a child because that's not considered an illness or an injury. So this allows them to use that for that purpose. And we felt like their request to bump that up from 30 to 40 days was reasonable. A lot of our teachers who um, are in that stage of life, they don't have that many uh, accumulated sick leave either because they're new in our district or if they've got kids, they, they're using that to take care of those kids. So this is just a minor change, but one that they felt was important and one that we thought was, was reasonable. <coughs> so that, that kind of covers our teacher agreement. Um, any, <coughs> any other questions on that? I'm gonna move to the classified or, or educational support agreement. And again, um, a lot of redundancies, um, cost of living the same, the uh, funding of insurance is the same, the step funding is the same. Uh, the one um, difference on this agreement is that um, uh, a lot, some of our classified employees and particularly the ones that we work with um, through this negotiation process, they do have year round contracts. That would be like um, some of our school secretaries, maintenance, custodians, uh, technology. Um, and because they have a 245 day contract or more, they do qualify for vacation leave with the district. And um, the policy on vacation leave when someone um, leaves our district is that we would pay out up to 20 days of that accrued vacation leave. And um, honestly, we, we do have a lot of employees in that category that accrue more than that. Um, and it's, it's always disheartening when, when they have to give that up when they leave. We, we do see vacation leave more as a vested um, benefit. Um, and so they made the request and, and we, we had been thinking about this as well that we wanted to increase the option of paying that out from 20 days to 30 days. Um, and then also for employees that retire under our district retirement plan, that if they had more than 30 days of vacation that they hadn't used, that they could convert that into sick leave and have that paid out under that district uh, retirement benefit. And it's not paid out at their daily rate with that, it's, it's, it's a lower rate, but uh, again, they would feel like those days were valued. and. We want them to use their vacation days, but there are certainly times and circumstances when they're so busy that they can't or they, they don't. So we just wanted to recognize that um, if they're not taking that and they're dedicating their time to us, we appreciate that and we don't want to um, unfairly penalize them for that. So that, that one, like I said, is, is specific to um, our classified employees and it would also apply to administrators who have um, a 245 day contract or more as well. We would apply that, that same um, uh, protocol to them. So that's the classified, any questions on that? So that change on uh, vacation leave will also apply to administrators, although it's not listed in your administrator. Correct, uh, and um, in our policy, uh, vacations um, are not necessarily assigned to an employee group because they, um, they really apply only to administrators and classified. Um, and the vacation days that an employee gets depends on how many years they've been with us. So it's a graduated scale up to 20, year, uh, 20 years and higher than it, it's 20 days of vacation. And so because it doesn't really fall in either category um, and the majority of those that it does qualify for um, are classified, we felt like this fit better. 
Um, the, the vast majority of our administrators uh, are under a 245 day contract. Um, I would say there's only five or six um, administrators that, that fall into that category. So yes, administrators could benefit from this, but it would only be a small uh, percentage of them. Any other questions on that? Okay, lastly, um, our administrators, and you'll see that um, we, we always call our agreement with our administrators a meet and confer. Um, this is a little less formal than our negotiations with our other groups. Um, that's just the way that it's evolved in our district. We do have an administrative association. We do have a presidency. In fact, a new one got elected or um, railroaded today. <laughs> that's, that's usually what it is. is uh, uh, it, it's a one-year term, and we try to bump that between um, an elementary representative and a secondary. And it's, it's not someone that's in the district. Uh, we we want to make sure that we separate that a little bit. Uh, but that association and, and that process is slightly less formal. But in meeting with our administrators, um, there, there are a couple of slight differences. Um, the first is that we did not um, give them a, a, as high of a cost of living increase. Now, you'll know that our philosophy is that we're a family and we try to treat everyone the same. Um, but uh, administrators have been paying a small portion of their health insurance for several years. And for a lot of our new administrators who um, are not familiar with the background of how that, that came to be, it's, it's been a source of frustration. Um, and so we worked with our administrators to say, hey, if, if, if that's something that you want to change, there needs to be an appropriate trade-off. And um, we felt like that half percent uh, on the COLA would be uh, a fair trade-off to eliminate them continuing to pay health insurance premiums, which they're the only group that does. Um, Full-time teachers and classified, we continue to pay 100% of their health insurance premium for whatever coverage they need, um, single, two-party, or family coverage. So uh, this was a year where, um, as they discussed it um, and looked at both sides of that, they felt like that was a good trade-off, and, and so their, their settlement agreement is slightly different. Um, there's also one other change. Uh, we, we did agree to fund the step and lanes, as we've done with the other groups. But here's a, another case where there was a slight difference in uh, one of the longevity steps for our administrators. And this goes back 12 or 13 years ago when we changed our retirement benefit. Um, we, um, we changed that benefit by trying to wait the 28th step so that um, employees could maximize their retirement with URS if they, if they were gonna get 30 years. Um, and so that 28th step is, is a 10% increase. And when you're working on your high three for your, uh, your best retirement outcome, um, this, this works really w well for employees that get there. With administrators, we split that and, and added another step, 30. So we split that 10% between a 28 and a 30. And there was really not justification to do that other than um, some of our administrators stay longer than some of our other employee groups. And that's not always true, but it, it again, it was a source of, of uh, frustration and, and concern because we do have administrators that do want to retire at 30 years and uh, under this system they're really kind of incentivized to stay to 33 to get that high three to maximize that so uh, we we did agree to um, consolidate those two steps into the 28 um, and make it similar to the other um, employee group um, salary schedules in that that line or um, along those lines. 
So th those are some differences with our administrators, uh, but again, we felt like they were all fair and justified and um, will result in less confusion as we bring new administrators in, into the district. Um, the teachers, uh, as I understand it, have ratified. Um, the classifieds, again, their, their system is a little less formal, but um, to my knowledge, they've ratified as well, and administrators have also. Um, so the last uh, part of this process would be for the board to give their approval, which I'm not asking for tonight. This is just a report, uh, but uh, for the next um, June meeting, we hope to, to get approval for these. Any questions? No, but I just really appreciate how both sides that I can <laughs> negotiate so well together without animosity and just trying to make everything work. And I think you're very key in that role and make it all very smoothly, so thanks. Well, thank you and thanks to you and Roger both for coming and, and helping us with that. that. That helps to have that support and understanding there, so thank you. All right, all right. thank you, Kurt. Okay, thanks, thank you. Kurt. Appreciate you being here. Next on our reports agenda, professional development for principals by Tim Smith. Oh, by Jerry Thomas. Tim's gonna let me talk for the elementary. You want first? Well, you handed me the mic. I well, thought I, I was handing you an extra mic. Oh, well, you go first then. I'm gonna sit down. <laughs> I'm not letting you talk yet. <laughs> Just a couple personal notes. One is I, I look at the counselor group that was here. I have a special place in my heart for counselors. I've spent many hours arguing and struggling with counselors on what's best for students. And some of my best memories in this district has been um, those back and forth on how we can help students be more successful. And I know that group really cares about students, so it's fun to have them here. Uh, second personal note is, and I think I speak on behalf of all of the administrators at the district office, um, but I just wanna speak more personally and publicly thank the board for this year. Um, this has certainly been a year like no other. And if I think back about uh, last summer in June, during this uh, upcoming week when we were meeting with administrators and trying to debrief after the spring that we had and figure out what we could do better as we went into the next school year. And then as we were required by the state to do the reopening plan and uh, bring that before the board. And uh, I kind of wish Chris were here tonight um, just because even even his dissent on that reopening plan, um, reflecting back means a lot to me because I think we need to be, um, we need to have those different opinions and, and go back and forth because it was important what we were trying to accomplish to open the doors of the district. And um, wow, it, it really feels good to be standing at this point and having finished the year Monday through Friday and had our kids in school and it wasn't always easy, but um, we just appre I appreciate the support of the board through all of that. We just have a great board, and I can't tell you how good it was to have the superintendent uh, of 25 years and Mike Lichty, uh, his right-hand man, with us all year because they have an experience that a lot, some of us in the district office don't have. So when we got a little yancy about things or had a little anxiety, they'd always calm us down and, and um, help us know everything was gonna be okay. So I appreciated them. And then can't say highly enough for all the staff in the district that showed up to work and believed we could do it and we pulled it off, so. All right, um, I think I misunderstood this item a little bit when it was explained to me. So I, I wasn't sure it was professional development for principals. I thought it was professional development in general related to our strategic plan. Um, so I may have cast my net a little bit too broad, but um, I wanted to just 
talk in general about a couple of items because I think it's important you understand our professional development philosophy in the district overall as we get into the, uh, the part about professional development for the principals. And Terry, am I right? You wanted that specifically on the strategic plan? Help uh, me, help me clarify. Because, because I was, I was rereading the strategic plan last week and, or the week before, I guess, not last week. And, and realized that at the top of the list, it says each new principal will be assigned a leadership coach and receive professional development to assist them. And, and um, but at our last meeting, the superintendent said that we can't, you can't teach a principal how to be a principal. And so I'm wondering, and, and I've heard from multiple principals who feel, have felt at times unsupported with trying to learn the ropes. So since this is part of our, I mean, we've published this, that we are doing that. So I just wonder. So what's it's that happening. specific line in there. So I'm asking, I'm just asking for a report on what's okay. happening for principals. Okay. Because we have a lot of new principals. Yes. Not so many immediately this year, but they're relatively young in their principalship. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering who's mentoring them, who's, who's helping Kay. them through the difficulties <coughs> of learning how to be a principal. Okay, great. And that, I will, I will definitely get to that. Um, let me just say in general a f PD philosophy. So um, I believe that every single employee that comes to work for the district ought to have training on how to do their job effectively. And a lot of that training has been supplied by departments. You know, when the nurse, when a new nurse comes in or a new health aide, the nurses take them and they train them or the nurses take and train the secretaries um, or uh, transportation has always done a fabulous job making sure the bus drivers have the training that they need to be successful behind the wheel of our buses. So we've had a lot of really good things going on in the district, but from top to bottom, as we look at every single position in the district, um, having specific training in place hasn't always happened um, for everything. So for example, I get hired as a new teacher, I get new teacher orientation, I get um, a day of training. Uh, if you're in the elementary, you get an, uh, an extra day that's specifically set on the elementary curriculum, which is absolutely fantastic. You used to get no power school training, no canvas training, um, you would go out and you'd find the teacher next door to you and say, how do you use PowerSchool and how do you use Canvas and how, how do you do these things? And so one of the goals we've had as a, um, a team in the district is to provide that training to every employee. So the one paper uh, that I gave you with the white sheet is a little bit reflective of that. And I just printed this out. This is just simply starting in August, I believe, through the first couple of weeks in December. All of the things that we have going on in the district to provide training for employees, and you'll notice as you read down through that, some of that is for teachers, some of it's for secretaries, some of it's for computer lab specialists, um, uh, some of it are for, is for administrators. Um, so we are far from where we want to be, but that's the goal is that every employee gets the training that they need when they come into the district. One of the most consequential things we've done as a school district in the last four or five years has been the instructional coach. Mm -hmm. and, the and the instructional coach spends one-on-one -on -one time with every single new teacher that comes into this district for the first three years of their career. So when we wrote the strategic plan, we wanted that same standard with administrators, is that we began to coach and mentor um, our administrators. Are we there yet? No, that's, but that's where we want to be. We want that same level of coaching with our administrators. There's a statewide movement with standards for administrators, what they should know. Um, we, I, I will be honest and tell you, we didn't pay a lot of attention to that, that work this year in the middle of COVID, um, but that's definitely a goal. So we have this strategic plan. Um, one of the areas that, um, well, one of the things I really like about our strategic plan is its simplicity. And um, this is a book by Mike Schmoker called Leading with Focus. 
and I just want to read you a quick paragraph out of here. It says, to succeed best, leaders must severely limit their focus to the most effective actions and repeatedly, even obsessively, clarify their expectations around those actions. And if we can simplify and in the process demystify effective school leadership, leadership, we will multiply the number and proportion of ordinary people who become effective leaders. Um, so, my, if you've never read this book, it's absolutely fabulous. It's um, Mike Schmoker, we had him scheduled to come in and, and work with the teachers in the spring when we were uh, interrupted by COVID. He is coming, I have him scheduled on September 9th. He's not coming to work with all the teachers though. He's coming to work specifically with our administrators. This book is written for administrators. And the topic of that training will be, how do we focus on the strategic plan, the simplicity of that plan, to make some real headway in our district with regards to that. Can I ask you a question on that? Uh-huh. Okay, so um, I wrote down on my notes um, that we need to discuss as a board how to get this strategic plan to the principals and then to the teachers and right. other workers and then to our patrons. Right. So are you planning to do some kind of a presentation on this plan? Yes, on we that September 9th day. Okay, because yes. we took them to right. the school community council. Some people dropped them off. I did a little presentation, which also included the parents there, and they were so impressed. And I just think everybody who has a connection to this district should know what our plan is. Absolutely, yep. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there. Yeah, you're, you're right on the money. Um, so there is definitely an academic focus in that strategic plan. There's an administrator focus. If we wanna focus just on you know, what Mike Schmoker has to teach, that's good. There's probably lots of other professional development we need to be doing with our administrators. Gary's gonna speak a little bit to what he does with the elementary principals, which I think would be great if it was replicated with, um, with the secondary principals down the road. He, um, he's got a lot of young, young principals in the elementary setting. And uh, he'll, he'll speak to you about the mentoring that he's been doing there. I just want to mention one other thing. Um, it's in the spirit of it's been a year, um, and Kathy did a fabulous job speaking at the, one of the graduations I went to on the, the hero effect um, by Kevin Brown. One of the things we've never done in this district is gotten all of our staff together, and we're not just talking teachers. We do a good job getting our teachers together, but bringing lunchroom staff, bus drivers, uh, cook, um, computer lab folks, everybody custodians that works for the district together. Kevin Brown is coming on September 14th. We're gonna have a late start that day. I've been working on with, with the superintendent and it's actually his idea that he brought to me um, last year from a uh, USBA that he went to, and I think many of you were exposed to Kevin Brown. Um, but I love the message here coming out of COVID, and I love the message that the soup wants to convey, which is every single one of us is important in the life of a, of a child. And, um, and when a child gets on a bus or goes through a lunch line or runs into the custodian in the hall or the secretaries in the front office or a teacher in a classroom, they ought to have the same experience um, with that adult. That, and that's what we're trying to convey. In your strategic plan, it says one of the areas of focus is safe schools um, and schools where kids feel safe coming. And my wife and I were talking is about what do parents want when they send their kids to school. They want a safe place for their kids to be. They wanna know that the adults at the school care about their kids. They wanna know that they have good relationships with their peers, and they wanna know that they're gonna learn something valuable when they're there. And um, I think that's the message of this, is we wanna make sure that there are adults that care that it's a safe place to be, because if we're gonna impact school shootings and school safety issues, we gotta start way upstream of identifying those kids. You always say when you hear that, well, gosh, if we, we saw the signs, we just didn't do anything. We gotta see the signs earlier and, um, and start doing things earlier. So um, I think that'll fit in well with the strategic plan. Um, 
and you're welcome to ask any questions. I could go over lots of other training that we're doing, but not specifically to the principals. So I'm gonna let Gary talk about um, some of the stuff he's doing with the principals and staff. <clears throat> okay. When, uh, when the superintendent says you can't teach him how to be a principal, there's a little bit of truth to that. Um, I think of Audrey McKell, who was a first year principal. She started in February of last year and then we shut down in March because of COVID. Um, prior to her job as a building principal, she was one of our instructional coaches. She went back to her instructional coaches just a few months after being on the job and said, I need to apologize. She had told those coaches when she was in the role of a coach, these principals have got to get in these classrooms more often. Why are they not in these classrooms? When, if I'm ever a principal, I will always be in those classrooms. She then got into the role of a principal and realized, oh my word, there are so many things coming at me all day long. I'm not getting into the classrooms like I thought I would. I apologize. Paula Hull, who we just hired to be the principal of Nibley Elementary for next year, has been attending principals meetings for five years now. Every principal meeting, every elementary principal meeting for five years she's been there. She knows this group well, and she thought she understood what they do. She's now assuming the role as a principal, and she's been in my office every day for the last three weeks for an hour or two. I didn't realize this. Now that she's sitting in that seat, she's feeling that weight, and, and some of it, you, you have to sit in that seat in order to feel that weight and understand it. But you're absolutely right. We have uh, three-fourths of my elementary principals are in their first five years. And I recognized that early. And so what I did, who's their coach? I'm their coach. Um, and, and I took that role specifically and, and have called myself their coach in a lot of ways. Um, three to six principals a day call me. Gary, I got a situation. I'll get there by Thursday of last week, the second day before school is out. Gary, I got a hot parent coming in in 15 minutes. Can you give me a call when you get in? I just want to run a couple things past you, best way to handle it. So I call him quick. Um, who was my coach as an administrator? I can tell you it was Lynn Archibald. I was Lynn Archibald's assistant principal for two years at Willow Valley Middle School. Every time he walked past my office, if I had a hot parent in there, and he, he just plopped down. If I had a student discipline situation, he plopped down. Once a month we sat there and we went over the budget. So Lynn was my coach as I was in that role. Secondary has a unique opportunity with at least an, one assistant in every building and you know in our high schools too, uh, that they can close the door, they can sit down and they can have that discussion. An elementary principal role is very isolated. There is no one else to bounce those ideas off of. So what I've done um, in this role, Every month, the, the week following our regular principals meeting, I have what I call a PLC meeting, a professional learning community opportunity for all of my principals. It's not mandatory, but I can tell you we get about 90% attendance every month. Um, and I do not create an agenda for that meeting. We just sit down and we talk about what are you dealing with right now? What's on your plate? And we try to give the experience of all the others, including myself, to those that just don't have the experience yet and give them ideas on how to handle everything from dress code to fires, literal fires that we had this year, to you know, other things that just happen on a daily basis. So in addition to me being their coach, I've also assigned them a mentor, someone who has been in that role longer than five years. And so that's kind of how we have addressed that in the elementary. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, I know that you're just starting out on this, but finally, teachers who are mentoring other teachers are going to be paid a stipend. Will the principal mentors get a stipend? No, they won't. Um, it's, just, it's just part of what we do. And what it, what's been fun is it has generated such a close-knit family as they turn to each other. Um, the, I, the last one we did just a couple weeks ago, I actually refrained from answering some of their questions because it seemed to be I was doing a lot of the talking and I just waited that teacher awkward silence time until some of the others stepped up and started to take it. A and they are doing a great job mentoring each other that way and they actually welcome it. Um, they, I, I, no one has even asked that and, and I just think now it's become a part of this is what we do as the elementary principal family. So it's probably just on a as need basis 
more than like a teacher would have uh, on a daily basis. Yes, they have a go-to. They can call anyone and say, hey, I got a question about this, but they've got one in particular that is kind of you know assigned to them, help them get started, here's what I do, call me anytime, I'm there to help you. I like the idea of a systematic PLC, a regular PLC meeting with them where you don't have your agenda because uh, general and other principals meeting um, is a lot of information from other people coming to them and not opportunity to discuss. Yeah. So that's an excellent idea. And I've limited, I, to be honest, I don't let anybody else into that meeting. I've let Tim into that meeting a couple times just so he can see. But in all honesty, they need to be in a room just by themselves so that they can talk very candidly and it builds that trust. Uh, I met with every principal last week um, on a one-on-one -on -one as we kind of had a closing conference. And that was overwhelmingly the number one thing that they appreciated and thanked me for was that PLC opportunity on a monthly basis. They said, we love that. And, th and they had told me they felt very supported because of it. So hopefully that's the case. Excellent. Good. Thank you. Okay. For us. Yeah, can we join you in September for those two trainings? Uh, absolutely. We'd love to have you. Awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be an interesting thing to bring our 2,605 employees all to one place. Where are you doing that at? We're going to try it at Green Canyon. If we can fit 2,685 in the bleachers, and we'll put chairs on and increase that by three or 400 and see if we can get outside. everybody in there. Hopefully COVID is not rearing its ugly head. Oh, no, in inside. Gym. In, the gym. in the gym. Yeah. Okay, so. great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next item, school board meeting schedule. Oh, this doesn't have a presented by. So I guess y'all will have to present it. <laughs> um, just look at the dates. Um, Carolyn put on um, the notes for the ones that are different than normal first and third Thursdays of each month when um, like fall break in October and uh, the USBA conference, annual conference in January, and the NSBA conference in April. So those months have adjusted board meeting dates. Mm -hmm. Any questions, concerns, comments? I thought they looked good. Is there gonna be a uh, USBA one at uh, Vermont this year? There is uh, at the Zermatt in September. Um, unfortunately, they're talking about limiting it to three board members who could go, but um, we'll see what happens uh, as they finish the planning for that. And that, I, th I think it's the second weekend, so I don't think there's a conflict. That'll but come up. But I'll check in uh, September. I think I, I, let me look here. I wrote it down here on some things. The the leadership conference is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Okay, great. It will be the last Thursday. September sixteenth, seventeenth, and eighteenth. Oh, so that will be a a problem for us. So do you want to move that to the 23rd instead of the 16th, our local meeting, our regular board meeting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the 23rd? Yeah. Um, since there are five Thursdays that month, that's helpful. Okay. I'll yeah, that's fine. We'll change the 16th meeting to the 23rd. And then um, everything else looks good. I notice there's uh, board retreats scheduled both in the sp spring and the fall. Well, they're about two months apart from each other, it looks like. Isn't there one in showing one in board retreat? June and then one in 
Well, August? there's one in August this year, and then there's one in June next year. Yeah, I was saying, I didn't know there was planning that you're going to do like a June and August every year. Well, we uh, usually have done June, but we changed it at our last meeting to August, so that's why it's not June of this year. Yeah. Okay. So normally we do do them in June, but last year because of how crazy it was, we did it in August, and then this year, um, because we were sort of uh, distracted in April and May by other things, we decided to move the board retreat to August. So, any other questions, concerns? Okay, great. We will change the one date in September and then bring it back next uh, next meeting for approval. Gail, over to you. Final legal budget. Um, well, first thing we, we have is a responsibility to s set the final legal budget for this current uh, 2021 school year. And uh, it's been quite a year. When you think about when we set this budget last June, at that point in time, we were anticipating the legislature was actually going to reduce funding for public education. There was a lot of unknowns as we were putting that budget together. And there was a special session of the legislature where they actually increased the value of the weighted pupil unit, I believe it was 1.8%, uh, which floored us. I mean, we were excited for that. And so that made a lot of change. Um, and, and so th this budget that we present is not just numbers on a page. It, it's a legal responsibility that we have to maintain as far as, as administering public funds. Uh, so when we're audited, the audit is measured against this budget to make sure that we're, we're not functioning outside of those parameters that are legally authorized. And uh, you can see I have to just stay focused. My dear, I don't have my glasses on. Ah, auto focus. Okay. There we go. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, we're doing well as far as. Okay. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Yeah. Come on, push that button. There we go. Okay. Anyway, the report that you have on board docs is this one here. And uh, what it reflects is first looks at the revenue of the school district by fund. And it will show here the in blue the actual amounts or, that we adopted as the, the preliminary budget last June. And then what is in the darker green is what is being proposed as the adjusted uh, final budget for this year. To the right of that will show the difference between the beginning and the, the ending budgets, and then a percentage of what that represents of change. And so uh, some of the large changes that we'll see in this budget, as we typically have had, is the, the, uh, the K-12 
carryover balance brought forward. And this first is looking just at the general fund itself. And uh, so we actually had almost $8 million of additional beginning balances that were brought forward. When we build the budget, we don't we don't try to guess what every program's carryover balance is going to be and what how much the uh, schools will carry over in their supply allocation and, and everything else that's involved there. And so um, we don't want to build into in the budget for salaries and benefits with with just carryover funds because they're actually one-time funds that once you spend those, they don't automatically get regenerated. And so if you put it into an ongoing expense, you get yourself in trouble real fast. And so we, we exclude those things for that purpose. Um, you'll notice that the property tax rate um, were set in June, and so those amounts didn't change at all. So in local revenue, the really the only change we have is carryover balance, and then also down about two-thirds of the way down the page under donations, there's one that's called JVS After School Program. Uh, that's with the uh, JVS meatpacking out in Hiram um, had funding that they wanted to give back to the community. And so they, they have agreed to fund an after school program at, I believe, Canyon, Lincoln, and Nibley, uh, which again is kind of the majority of the areas where their employees work. But... Uh, so they have they have contributed three hundred forty five thousand dollars to uh, to run that program, and that, that's a that's a brand new program, and it's a, it's a great addition. Um, the other changes we have when we get down into state funding, you'll notice that our largest line item is here with the uh, the K twelve funding, where we're actually funded in essence for the number of students we have in our district, and. Uh, and so we did have an increase there over what we projected with the increased value of the weighted pupil unit also. We thought it was going to be a reduction. It ended up being an increase. So there was $771,000 increase in that line. Um, and that type of increase reflects in all of these programs at the very bottom of the page that are WPU driven. Um, those are the programs that are considered above the line. We, we talk about that. And so... Uh, those, those funding, I guess, really are increases driven by the increase in the value of the WPU. Um, there's a number of, of items that uh, will show up in here. One is like uh, the Applied Technology or CTE program add-on. Um, this increase of uh, $1.6 million uh, really was was more of a carryover from the prior year. They had a, a good carryover from the year before. So what's shown in this line, line item is not only just the new money that's received in each of those categories, but it includes any carryover because of the ruling the state has is that we don't recognize revenue until it is actually expended for the purpose that it was allocated. And this is just with state revenue. And so, the monies that CTE didn't spend a year ago, we didn't recognize as revenue. We call them deferred revenue. They come into the next year's uh, financials and are included with the current revenue that they have available. So, um, so again, CTE has available 4.9 million in that line item, which includes their their new year allocation of about 3.2 million, and then the carryover for the balance. Um, we did have a lot of. Uh, COVID relief type funds that, that we received that all came after the original budget was established. One of those is $2.7 million that we received here of state funding that was uh, awarded through the, uh, the, the state itself. A lot of the other funding came as federal dollars. So they are actually on page three where we had uh, 744000 come in as ESSER, ESSER 1 fund. Um, the ESSER 2 funds is $4.6 million. Uh, that really is, we're just barely beginning to uh, expand a lot of those funding. And then we have actually for next year, what is it, $7.4 I believe, of, of what we call ARP ESSER fund 
which is the third level of funds coming from the federal government um, that's focused on trying to help kids in retaining or capturing ed learning loss that they incurred being out for, for COVID. So, so does that, uh, do these funds pay for the teachers to teach summer school? So those seven million dollars of, of ARPS or funds don't reflect in this year's budget. They became actually awarded by the legislature um, in that special session they recently held. They it may be in the New Year's New Year's budget, so it'll show up there. Uh, but all in all, in revenue, when you look at the very bottom on page three, uh, we actually have twenty-six million dollars of additional funding um, available this year. Well, in this year that's ended ending right, right now um, in comparison to the original budget that we established back in June. Dale, is that mostly one-time money or is that any of that ongoing? Uh, some of that is ongoing. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, and, and that'll it'll reflect in also the expenditure side where we'll, we can't just keep the money and sit on it. We, we've got to use it. So, um, like I say, we've got all of these other programs that are starting up where those those new dollars will be expended for. Um, <laughs> here you go. <laughs> yeah. Way to go, Dale. Uh, yeah. Um, the other changes that we have um, on page four down at the bottom would be in your capital outlay fund. And uh, majority of that was carryover funds of projects that hadn't been completed uh, that were in the prior, prior year's budget. Mm -hmm. So those weren't new dollars. Um, but we did also have to increase the budget down under other financing sources. There was almost $1.3 million of lease proceeds that we received under the uh, this Johnson Controls program. And then all of the construction for the improvements that are being done, even though they're being paid back through the general fund with reduced uh, operational cost, utility cost, the actual construction of those is expended through the capital, the capital outlay fund. And so uh, that, uh, that, that shows down there, that's that 1.3 that we're looking at. Um, but again, this is just, this is the revenue side. So the expenditure side is going to be on, on the other half. Um, and those are the bulk, I think, of the, the biggest changes that we had in the budget itself. If you look at page six, the summary of all, all of the funds combined, you can see that we actually have an increase of $45 million dollars in total over the original budget that was set. And uh, you can see 23 million of that had to do with carryover funds, and that's both in the capital outlay fund and in the general fund mainly. Uh, a lot of state in state increased funding of 12.7 million, um, and then federal funding of 7.8 million. Um, so like I say, it, that budget when you first set it in June not the final step, it's just the beginning, and it's, the, it's just our best guess at that point. Will, a lot of things are will some of the extra go over into like our rainy day fund? I know we don't call it that, but. We, we did not increase the uh, undistributed reserve, is what they call that. Okay. It's still at 5.5 million. It'll take an action of the board to do that. Generally, we'll wait until after the audit is completed, and then we can see what kind of carryover balance we have and at that point decide how much, if any, you'd like to increase that reserve. 
from the carryover balance? There's a, a $200 million, or yeah, $2 million uh, increase in uh, the school food service fund. Yeah. Is that from the federal government paying for all lunches to, and breakfast to be free? It is. They, they had quite, a, quite an increase in carryover balance just a year ago. Um, again, like you say, it, from May, March on, it, it was all the, the funding for school lunch was paid by the federal, um, federal government. And we also get state funding from the state liquor tax for each of those meals served, too. Hmm. And, uh, and so, yeah, they, they did very, very well. More so, so, than so we're going to start serving prime rib in the <laughs> high school <laughs> lunch rooms. <laughs> Have my vote. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, talk to Carrie about that. <laughs> um, okay. So on, on page seven this is where we start the expenditure side, and I won't take much time on here because these increases are are spent in a number of different ways. Most of the federal funds were used in purchasing either. Uh, PPE, the personal protective uh, equipment, um, or we hired teachers. We were doing a lot of online instruction, so we were paying for additional teacher FTE through uh, federal funds that way. Um, again, like I say, it's, it's not just one line item I can point to and say mm -hmm. this right. because of that. Um, but again, it will it will reflect the same increase as the revenue does, because we're required to budget to expend every penny that we have as a district, um, even though we don't anticipate that. But uh, that's one requirement, is that, that our revenues have to balance with our expenditures that are budgeted. Um, so if you... Dale, is the increase in capital outlay fund for new buildings, addition, design, remodels, the $14 million increase there, is that for the remodel at the district office? Um, that was part of it. There was about four or five different projects. We had several at South Dash that we did. Um, Mountain Crest had about $150,000 in what their bill is. I don't know they had that their athletic South area. Dash. Yeah. South Dash, they added some classrooms, and did they? Classrooms? Yeah, he said that. Um, okay. yeah. What was the South Dash one? Mountain Crest had about 30 classrooms. Okay. We, we've modified some classrooms from CP to regular classrooms, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, all those projects were finished up. Um, and then we did take one and a half million that we had available there and focus that toward the new construction of 10 classrooms at, at uh, Green Canyon High School. And then we've had to pull an additional one and a half million out of this next year's budget to complete those projects. Um, so that, that's where those increases are, I recognize there. So really the, uh, the budget that we'll, the next board meeting look to adopt as a final legal budget total $264 million um, compared to the $219 million budget we originally approved in June. So we'll take action on that in the board meeting. Unless there's any questions. Nope. Let's go on to the new year. Thank you very much. Yeah. The next item Thanks, is guys. the proposed budget for the next year. Okay. This is a fun one. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to start out first. We're still waiting to get final property tax assessed value figures from the, the county. Um, I talked with Diana Schaefer and the, the auditors, the county auditor's office yesterday, and uh, she said by June 8th they should be able to have all of their figures approved, certified by the state tax commission, and at that point would be able to um, move forward. The numbers that I have from her, she feels very confident will be approved by the state. And so we can at least discuss them tonight, knowing that they may change, but uh, there's only one that I think is 
it may be changed considerably, and that's the basic levy rate. That one is not set until all of the information from every county in the state is certified by the state, and then they back into a dollar amount that the legislature had set um, that needs to be realized in property tax revenue. And so they'll set that rate at whatever's needed to generate that, that level of dollar. Um, there was an estimate that was prepared by the, uh, probably a combination of the state tax <coughs> commission and the state school board that I've built into to our figures here, but to that one I, I really think will change, but I hope we get it in time for our, our meeting when we adopt the budget, because that one may have to be adjusted. Um, but the big thing that you've probably seen looking at real the real estate market is home prices have just gone crazy the last while. Uh, Diana was telling me that for residential properties is kind of a, a blanket um, increase across the entire county that she says they're looking at about a 30% increase in the values of residential property. Good grief. Um, it, it didn't tie out exactly the numbers they're building here, but that's what we'll probably realize as taxpayers. And I don't know if every property will be reassessed at that amount, or if they do again do just a por portion, usually they do about a third of the, the property each year across the county. But we do have in total, total taxable, or the total taxable value of property in the district, almost a 20% increase. It's a 19.73% increase over what we had last year. What that is in this second column of numbers, these, this is when you compare the property that was on the tax rolls a year ago with how they are now looking at for 2021, that they've, they've gone up almost 12.5%. And when you add in new growth, which is $436 million, um, it brings up the total increase in assessed value at 19.73%. So we, we'll set our tax rate based on $7.1 billion of, of property here in the district that's taxable, the taxable value of that. And that's by far the largest increase we've ever incurred. We did have a big one way back in 2007, just before the bottom fell out. No. <laughs> there you go. Anyway. Are you prophesying? <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying anything that, that means anything here in the future, but... Who knows? So using the figures that we have, the intent is that we will set the property tax rate at the certified tax rate. That is the rate that would generate basically the same number of dollars um, as it did a year ago, except that you can get increased revenue by new property that's coming new on the tax rolls. So that's the growth part. But so you can you actually get an increase in, in taxes in that sense. But with a larger tax base and having it generate the same number of dollars as it did the year before, the tax rate has to come down. And that's that's what we have. Now, We, uh, if you look at some of these items like the voted leeway, last year we were at a tax rate of 001515 and it will actually come down to a 001434. So it, it's come down quite a bit. Um, same thing with the, uh, the board levy, capital levy. The one thing we remember now, we just did the, uh, the bond refunding. And part of that was restructuring the debt service on that, trying to pull some of that principal forward so that uh, we could help maintain that rate without having it drop. In fact, we wanted, our focus was to have that be at a rate of 0026. That was Preston and I's goal when we did it. But none of us anticipated this kind of growth on, on the tax base. So so the actual tax rate, instead of going up to the 0026, is going to drop from this year's at the 002402 down to a 002373. So it will come down, but it will generate uh, a little over $2 million of extra funding, even though the rate is, is being lowered. Mm -hmm. um, so the tax, well, and like I say, this basic rate 
is quite a bit higher than we had this year, this past year, and I, I really anticipate that's going to come down when the the uh, state tax commission fin finalizes the basic rate. But even as it is right now, the total tax rate's going down from 0071 to 0070. So um, this isn't your area, but shouldn't we have some kind of information go out to the public saying that all of our tax rates are less than last year before they get their property tax bill that shows their homes have increased in value <laughs> and they're paying more? Yeah, we ought to put an ad in the paper. If they want to come protest it, they can come and do that <laughs> before one of our meetings. We need to do something, Tim. <laughs> yeah, we, we, won't do a, we won't do a truth in taxation hearing. If we adopt the certified tax rate, then we're not required to hold a, a truth in taxation hearing in, in August. So we well, but still, but maybe just for information, just for information yeah. to educate the public, because I know what they're going to be saying when they get their tax thing, and it's up. What do you say, twelve percent this year, or thirty percent, or whatever, on the, the value of their home? And that's not us. No, that's. And the other thing is, we should be saying yeah. our net. Our net is going to be worse because we're all paying them too. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We all one, live in one houses. One thing we would have to explain too is why we increase the debt service, why that rate isn't coming down equivalent to the others. I just think if people well, are educated about things, then they do not complain as much because they understand. Well, and it would be important. It would be even more important for them to understand that we aren't setting these. I mean, the state is the one who levies the tax. We just collect it for them. Yeah. That's well, true. Just a thought. Our debt is going down and our state debt is going up. But you're paying more but money. You're and we're paying more for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And most people look at the bottom line and, and they they really won't rate. listen to anything else. Right. Yeah. Well, we could try. Um, we could try. I have. <laughs> so this is the kind of comparison property I think taxes. <laughs> this is the comparison I think you're talking about right here. So that if we looked at in this past year and they say the average mark market value of a home in, in the county is three hundred and seventy nine thousand uh, dollars. That came from the state the county auditor's office. So if we have a, a home at three hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars at last year's tax rate, they would have paid $1,491 in taxes. That same value of home, so that their home isn't, value isn't going up, with the lower tax rate, it's actually going to bring down their taxes to fourteen sixty nine. It's, it's like $22. That'd be a $22 Unless reduction. Unless they're one of the lucky third who gets their yeah. home re revalued. <laughs> then their taxes are going to yeah. go up. Yeah. yeah. And the That's thing the hard thing to get them to understand mm -hmm. when their valuation went up 30%. Yeah. Well, we need to put our thinking caps on on how to get that information out and make them understand. Well, not make them, but help them understand. I, I agree with that. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Quite fair. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So and then I had a couple other just variations of the budget. One... One is the one that I used in salary negotiations where we looked just at um, unrestricted funds that we receive. So that excludes funds that are saved for special education or CTE or um, trust land funds or you know, any of those that are designated for a specific program and only for that program. Um, so these others are just general purpose funds. And uh, that's what we pay the bulk of the expenses out of there. But in building that, uh, the uh, the real changes that are involved in, in that would be, as Kirk explained today, we build a five and a quarter percent cost of living increase on the uh, teachers and the classified employees' salary schedules, a 4.75 increase on the administrator's salary schedule. Adjustments to the insurance, there's a 12% increase in premium for health and accident insurance coverage. 
And then one of the other things that we did was mention that we've changed the base contract to um, a 186-day base rather than 183. And so in the past, we've budgeted funds over in the uh, um, in-service training area that teachers would apply it for and we would pay those funds out of that area. Now those funds are just part of their base contract. So the, the whole 186 thousand, 186 day contract is paid out of the same program where the rest of their salary is paid from. And so it reduces about a little of a million dollars that we had over in the instruction, the, the in-service area of a, of a budget and put it up mostly in the instructional side under teacher salaries and benefits there. So it's mostly just kind of a shift, not a, much of an increase because we already had, like I said, like about 95% of the employees were, were being paid for those days already. Um, now it's just going to be part of their base salary. And uh, so 100% will be paid for that unless they take a day leave without pay for some reason. But, uh, and so that, that budget there, again, is what we use and, and explain in each of the uh, salary negotiation settings with the employees there. Um, I won't go through that in detail. But the final, the, the preliminary budget in total then is, is what uh, I think is the first file that you have there on board docs that uh, is the proposed budget for next year. And it shows in blue the, the actual expenditures and revenues that were occurred a year ago. It shows in green what I presented as the proposed final legal budget for this year. And then in salmon would be what we're proposing as next year's budget. And then the lighter salmon is just look, looking at the difference in the proposed budget with the current budget and the percentage change that reflects. Um, we haven't built in the property tax figures uh, in total here because in all of our, our budgeting for the voted leeway, the board leeway, and the, uh, the basic levy, um, those are all built on a formula determined by the number of students that we have and a guaranteed value that's set by the legislature. And so the basic rate, for example, is the same rate that every district in the state levies. And there's all but one district in the state that they don't receive enough in property taxes to meet their full guaranteed amount under the, the K-12 line item, basically. Um, and that's Park City. Um, but everyone else, irregardless of what we receive in local property taxes, the state is going to augment that with, with state subsidy and income tax revenue back to us to bring us up to our guaranteed amount. And so that'll be shown if you look on page two under, under state revenue, uh, right at the very top, you can say this year we had under the regular school program K-12 uh, budget of 53 million. That'll go up to 68 million next year. That's not all new revenue. Uh, that's just the 68 million includes both the revenue that we'll receive from property taxes plus the state guarantee. So we know that in total it's right but we'll still have to adjust that when we get the numbers from the, the state on our, our property tax collection. Um, same thing goes down in the, uh, right at the bottom of that page two under the local guaranteed programs, the voted leeway and board leeway. Um, you can see that the voted leeway last year was 9.2 million. Next year we're looking at almost 21 million, but that difference, 11 million is pretty much local property taxes that, that will make up. Same with the board leeway. So that's, it makes it a little hard to show comparability in, in those senses, but when we bring it back two weeks, those should all be clean numbers and, and we should be able hopefully to set the tax rate that, uh, that will be levied here for, for 2021 calendar year, our 2022.
22, or 21, 22 fiscal year. Um, so the general fund itself in total funding is actually showing about a six and a half million dollar decrease in funding over what we had budgeted this year. Um, a number of that has to do with with uh, federal COVID funding. Some of it has to do with carryover funding that's not budgeted in there, but is in the current year's budget. So those don't reflect. There was an $8 million difference a year ago just, just in that alone. Um, and so um, that, that kind of could help explain why that's so much different. Um, there's really very little change in the student activity fund, the debt service fund. You can see that uh, um, total expenses for Total revenue for the debt service fund was 16.8 million in this current year, and that'll go up to 18.1 million next year. And, and that had to do with, again, restructuring that debt as part of the refunding of the debt. Capital outlay. Uh, again, we're just anticipating a small carryover. Basically, the funds that are budgeted for the. Uh, classroom addition at, at Green Canyon and then there's uh, a couple other small things in there but uh, that's, that's the bulk of it in, in that regard and uh, and so on the expenditure side like I say we, we've made we've made the adjustments for the increases that were negotiated with the employee groups there's also now we'll have the debt service that we've got to pay back over the next 20 years for the uh, Johnson Controls energy retrofit that we did. And that's coming from savings in utility costs. And that's built on a guarantee that if the <coughs> utility savings are not actually realized, that Johnson Controls makes up that difference to uh, make our debt service payment whole. And uh, so we're, we're still working through on that to see where we are for this year. But uh, um, again, it's a lot of that hasn't been in place. I don't think the, the, uh, um, the solar e energy savings that we're supposed to have at Lincoln, or excuse me, at Lewiston Summit generated much. We had the, the fire out at, at uh, Summit that started when they first started that up, so I think they shut them down. Johnson has been very careful in trying to evaluate the system there to make sure that it's perfectly safe and that it, uh, it's kind of an embarrassment to them to have that happen and to make sure that it's done right and doesn't happen again. Um, so the, those savings really haven't been generated because I don't believe we've had the solar panels run full strength, or if they have, it's just been for such a short time that it really hasn't made much difference in our utility cost. Um, the, most of the others, I think, in the other schools where it were tied to lighting retrofits and that, those those are immediate savings as soon as those new uh, those new light fixtures and that and, and LED lighting is, is put in place, the savings start to be generated. So that'll, that'll be fun to watch and see how that that progresses. Um, so, I don't know, I need to, I'm not sure we can bore you with too many details if you want, but, um, but again, the expenditures would would total this, the same as, as the revenues. And uh, so again, the... Uh, the proposed budget for this year just ending was $246 million. For next year, right now, the budget is looking at $229 million, so it's $17 million reduction. Uh, again, a lot of that was a reduction in capital funding carryover that we've used to complete building projects. Carryover balances in the general fund, uh, those are the big buckets of part that make up that difference. I don't know, any questions on that?
Good job. With all the unknowns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll happen. So we'll we'll bring it back in in hopefully final form here for us to approve in two weeks if we can get the numbers from the state. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, next item on our agenda is board member reports and Kathy has a report. Okay, first of all, just a couple of announcements. Um, every year when the school year ends, I type cookies to the district office from all of us. So if anybody thanks you for cookies, that's what, what they're getting thanks for. And the second thing is while I was out delivering cookies, um, I had a little chat with one of the secretaries and she just said thanks so much to the board for all of the support this year and for the um, monthly thank you. She said that just meant so much. So thank you for all of that. And now I would just like to do a little presentation on getting ahead. Heads up everyone. It looks like that devil retirement is about to rear its ugly head in Dell's direction. Now this won't be over anyone's head and I'm sure we will be able to make heads and tails out of this because it is no head scratcher. Dell has always been a cool head, not a sore head, air head, big head, dead head, egg head, or one to bite off your head. He has never tried to drum something into someone else's head or bring anyone, hel anyone else's head in on a platter. Just a heads up, a headliner in fact. We know that Dell is heads and shoulders above all other business administrators in Utah. In fact, he has a good head on his shoulders and has always done everything he could to help our district get ahead. As he retires, he's not going to bury his head in the sand, bang his head against a wall, cause any heads to roll, or try to make heads or tails out of the future yet. He's just going to try to get a head start as his business administrator profession comes to a head. Speaking of heads, what makes up a person's head? It has a skull with a lower jawbone and cranium that houses a brain. It has a face with two eyes, two ears, one nose, and one tongue. Together, these organs function as a processing center for the body by relaying sensory information to the brain. During the past 30 years, Dell has been working his head off relaying information to his brain. He has kept track of revenue, expenditures, debt, service, interest, capital outlay, salaries, benefits, insurance expenditures, board meeting minutes, contracts, assets, bids, property taxes, tuitions, utilities, supplies, reserves, bonds, equipment, lunch sales, dental claims, bank balances, yada, yada, yada. So Dale, you must realize that we are all head over heels for all you have done for the Cache County School District. We know you've always wanted to get ahead and of course, we already realize you have a head, a good one. But as you head on down the road, we would like to make sure you do get ahead, a head. A personalized head <laughs> <laughs> to help you remember the positive impact you have had on our district <laughs> and our appreciation. Oh, a cop yes, you can have this. You can have a copy of it. <laughs> so do you actually have a black suit? Because after I have been working on this with the company, I realize you have not worn a black suit. Well, I don't want you to have your green one with me because. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, nice report. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> on to Jeff. Uh, you should have all received emails <laughs> this week you should be please uh, these are the same uh, evaluations we showed the freshman school last year so it should be diminished what we did in the past so uh, obviously I told him not to do the business administrator so he's, he's going with the superintendent role so okay. I, I, he had a I think it was a week or maybe the eighth was his June eighth that's what eight. it said but appreciated if you wouldn't mind logging in and clicking on evaluation. All right. Are 
everyone get on it. <laughs> and remember your open meeting law training, in case you haven't done it yet. Um, since we are at 7.30, we'll hold our board retreat discussion until um, after we have some results from the uh, evaluations and probably we'll, uh, we'll discuss board retreat next meeting if the agenda is not longer than this one. <laughs> thank you all for your patience and thanks for being here. Since the superintendent isn't here, we can, he gave you his, uh, his administrator changes for uh, 20, 21, 22 listed in board docs, you can see those. Um, so if you have questions about them, I guess you would need to address those to Steve since he's not here. And now that we're at the end of our agenda, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>